Uh, so I've hopefully motivated why we should care about regularization and also what regularization is. Now we're going to see how do we actually use it. And uh, I'm going to do that with uh, an NCAA data set that comes from this 2003 paper and is accessible on uh, Dr. Booz's website, uh, it turns out. And so this data set has information on 94 different uh, major NCAA Division I universities. Our response here, what we're looking at trying to predict, is just going to be our average um, six-year graduation rate. So we have d data on that from 1996 to 1998. Uh, I found this data set to be interesting because what the authors are actually trying to do is we're trying to see, uh, is, you know, is the success of your sports programs at your university, does that play a role at all in grad just overall graduation rates? So what they do is they they come up with two measures of that. One is going to be this uh, BB index. And so they, they actually use principal components analysis that Justin talked about last time to come up with some sort of basketball index to try to, um, to, try to actually rank the different teams. I didn't look into it that much. I just assumed that Indiana University was ranked first. Otherwise, it would be <laughs> a completely bogus uh, metric. Uh, but um, the other thing they look at is just average basketball attendance. In addition to that, we have 17 other predictors that are just very intuitive. So we're looking at standardized test scores, student to faculty ratio, those sorts of things that you just naturally would think would have an, uh, a role in graduation rates. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at least squares, ridge regression, and the lasso. And I'm just going to try to predict, build a predictive model um, and the predict graduation rates and just to try to see, OK, which method actually works best in this, in this case. I implemented this. Uh, it's with the GML, GLM, net package in R. Uh, I haven't played around with necessarily a ton of packages using regularization, but I definitely recommend this one because when it comes to regularization, there are some big names out at Stanford who are heavily involved in this. And, and those guys are the ones who are actively maintaining this package, so I just kind of trust them and uh, defer to them on this. So I think this is a good package and there's a lot of good documentation on it. And I am going to post uh, all of my code and everything on the SOG website once I clean it up a little. Um, but that is also going to be available in case that's helpful uh, for anyone. Is this graduation rate of app, student athletes? No, this is overall, yeah. So this is overall. They're trying to see, OK, if we have a successful sports program, is that going to affect graduation? Like, is that boosting morale, or are people out partying and celebrating victories, and so they're not graduating? <laughs> <laughs> so Indiana University never graduates. Yeah. yeah, we're all, yeah, we're, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're winning so much. We don't have time to study, so. <laughs> um, so one thing, again, that came up earlier is that, you know, when we actually do this estimation, our estimates are a function of lambda, a function of that tuning parameter. So you can imagine that. If I use a lot of values of lambda, well, I'm going to have a ton of estimates. And so computationally, that could potentially be an issue, is that I'm going to have to do this estimation a ton of different times. The good thing is that we have some efficient algorithms that exist to, to help us deal with this. So one that was uh, really important was uh, the Lars algorithm that uh, Efron and some others introduced in 2004. And uh, the Lars algorithm originally was for something else, but if you tweaked it slightly, you could adapt it to the lasso. Uh, and so this very efficiently gives you the entire solution path for the lasso. It's going to give you, as a function of lambda, all of your different uh, possible beta hat coefficients. Uh, so that was really important. I think that really kind of almost led to the lasso boom once it made it a lot more e uh, easy to actually implement it. Uh, Another thing that's usually important or very helpful when it comes to the solution path algorithms is piecewise linearity. So when I actually just look at the, my coefficients on a graph as a function of lambda, they're just going to be a bunch of connected linear functions. And if that's the case, all we have to do is just find those kinks, find where the linear function changes. And once I have those kinks, I can just interpolate and connect a bunch of dots, and I get the entire solution path. So once you just identify the kinks, you can get it. Uh, this is a cool paper that actually gets at that. It basically tells you, depending on the kind of loss function you're using and the, the kind of penalty function you're using, it's going to tell you exactly how you can go through and derive your piecewise linear solution path and whether or not it's even possible to do it. So this is, I think, kind of a cool paper. Some more recent stuff. 
Uh, so Friedman, and again, another guy out at Stanford and co-authored with some more Stanford guys, they have this pathwise coordinate descent algorithm, which I don't necessarily know a ton about, but I know it, it's supposed to be a fast algorithm that can handle big problems. I think that's actually what's used in the GL, GLM net package uh, for the implementation. And then another thing that's a little more recent, uh, if you've taken optimization at all, you probably heard of Stephen Boyd. He's the, the lead author on this. He and a bunch of um, people, again, some of which are out at Stanford, they're looking at this um, ADMM algorithm, which is actually an old algorithm, but they're trying to adapt it to um, some machine learning problems. So when it comes to the solution path to see exactly what I'm talking about here, for example, is I uh, found this lasso solution path for the NCAA data set. And so you can see here that on the y-axis, uh, we have our uh, coefficients here. So these are going to be the value pretty much at any value of lambda here, you just slice it and that's going to give you your corresponding coefficient estimates. Uh, it's graphed on the log lambda scale just to make the scale a little uh, more manageable. We can just imagine that lambda is down there at the bottom. Uh, and so you can see, again, some of the properties of the tuning parameter that if I'm way over here on the left, that's when I have essentially the least square solution. So I'm not really getting any variable selection. I just have, these are just the coefficients I'm dealing with. But as I sh shrink the coefficients, as I increase the penalization parameter and move to the right, you can see that these, these coefficients eventually are getting shrunk to zero. And one of the nice things, like I mentioned with the lasso, is that coefficients are going to be set exactly to zero. And we can see that here up at the top. Um, the top axis is telling us just the number of non-zero coefficients or the number of active coefficients that we're actually including in our model. So on the far left, again, with no or essentially no penalization, all 19 variables are going to be included. But as we increase the penalization, uh, Moving to the right here, you can see that the number of predictors is going to decrease, and at the end, we only get uh, a model that has one predictor. For uh, Ridge, on the other hand, um, kind of the key point with this that I just wanted to make is that you can, again, see that while Ridge is sh also doing shrinkage here, we're shrinking our coefficients to zero, up the top you can see that none of them actually ever get set equal to zero. So for any value of lambda, we still have 19 non-zero coefficients. So even though these things are really, really small, they never actually become set exactly equal to, uh, to zero. Any questions at all on the, uh, the solution path at all? This holds a special place in my heart because this is what I'm working on in my research is a solution path algorithm right now. So, um, so I, I at least think this stuff's cool, but I may be biased. Yeah, what's up? Um, you know, that's a good question. I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I guess off the top of my head, I'm not completely sure why the scales are even different on those two things. Any other questions or any? Thoughts on why that's the case? <laughs> uh, so when it comes to actually choosing this regularization parameter, which again is a, is a crucial step uh, in, in doing regularization, um, traditional ways to do that, again, some of the stuff I mentioned earlier, you can use the CP statistic, AIC, BIC, those sorts of things. Uh, Cross-validation is a, is a popular alternative we're now we're actually going to make this choice just based on the actual predictive performance of our model. Uh, it's also nice because we have to we have to make fewer model assumptions to actually uh, use cross validation, and uh, for that reason, it's also a little more widely applicable, so we can use it in, in in more settings. So I think I feel like cross validation nowadays is kind of the go-to method to do this. Uh, arguably, it wasn't popular. 30 or 40 years ago just because of the computational considerations involved with cross-validation, but now it seems to be essentially the, uh, the go-to method. And to see why we even want to use cross-validation is that 
you know, ideally what we would do is we would just essentially create this third validation set that we would use to pick our parameters. So we would fit our data on the training set, we'd use the validation set to actually pick which lambda we think is good, and then we'd go to the test set to see, that's when, again, we're releasing our model into the wild to see, okay, how is this actually going to perform in practice? Uh, we don't want to use the training set because that's going to that's going to encourage overfitting. It's probably not going to generalize well to new data sets. We don't want to use the test set to actually pick lambda because that tends to underestimate the actual error that we're going to see in practice. Uh, this is nice, but the problem is, is usually, especially if you've used data and done a lot of applied stuff, usually getting data is hard. So we don't always have a lot of data, and we don't really want to you know, sacrifice some data to actually create this separate validation set. And so that's what cross-validation does. Is it, it's basically a way to get around this, this lack of data and the, the need to create this third uh, validation set. So to look at exactly what cross-validation is, uh, and kind of the general form is just k-fold cross-validation. So k is just going to be the number of parts. We, we take our data, our training data, and we're just going to put it in to, to k parts. So here k is going to be 5, so I have these 5 parts or these five folds. You can just kind of imagine you're folding up a piece of paper and you have these five different uh, sections. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the data from k minus one of those folds. So here I have a total of five folds. k minus one is going to be four. I'm going to have these four, uh, these four folds that I'm going to pull together and use as training data. I'm then going to fit my model. Once I fit the model for multiple values of lambda, I'm going to use the validation fold to actually calculate my prediction error for the different um, values of lambda. And then I'm essentially going to repeat this process, uh, in this case, five times, because each, each fold is going to have its turn as being the validation set. And so I'm just going to keep rotating which set I use as the validation or which fold I use as the validation. And then at the end, I'm going to just average the things that I actually, the, the prediction error that I, that I found. Common choices of k are, are usually 5 or 10. Uh, n is also another one that's also called uh, leave one out cross-validation. Are there any questions on what cross-validation is or how it's used or anything? Uh, when it comes to actually picking lambda, the uh, people behind the elements of statistical learning advocate this one standard error rule, which I think is easier to see when you actually look at the graph. So this is actually tenfold cross-validation for the lasso using the NCAA data set. And so here on the, the y-axis, I just have the, the mean squared error that was estimated, and then I have the different lambda values down here uh, on the x-axis. And you can see that there are two lines here. One line represents the smallest mean squared error, and then for the other line, I'm going to look at all mean squared errors that are within one standard error of the minimum. And I'm going to just pick the one that's within one standard error of the minimum, but is the smallest model. So we kind of want to have the least complex model, the most interpretable model. Uh, and really, kind of, you know, what we're doing is, you know, if I look kind of in this range, because of just the sampling variability, those are, even though this lambda corresponds to kind of the, the quote unquote best uh, prediction error for this data set, Really speaking, these are roughly equal as far as performance because they're all within the standard error of one another. So to make that choice, they advocate just erring on the side of choosing kind of the simpler, uh, more interpretable model. Are there any questions on, on cross-validation? Uh, so I, again, I went through, I estimated least squares, I estimated lasso, I estimated ridge. Lasso and ridge were picked both based on the tenfold cross-validation. And here are what the uh, coefficients look like. Some of the key takeaways are just the black dots here are the, uh, the least squares estimates. And you can see that, you know, again, both ridge and lasso are doing shrinkage. So you can see that the, uh, the blue and red dots are, are closer to zero than the black dots because we're shrinking them uh, towards zero. And then another thing, again with the lasso, a lot of these red dots are being set exactly to zero. So for a lot of the predictors, they kicked them out. It actually, the final model for lasso only kept four different predictors. Uh, if you're curious, this one is just the, it's the 25th percentile of your H ACT scores of your students. That seemed to be kind of the most important predictor. Uh, another thing, 
I was really disappointed in least squares because this basketball index had a very large negative coefficient, which was uh, disappointing, but the lasso completely just kicked it out. So I tend to lean and agree with the lasso here that um, if anything, it's, it's not going to hurt your school. Um, finally, then to just look at kind of the test set MSC, look at the performance. Uh, in this case, it turned out that Ridge had the best test set MSC, followed by lasso, and then um, followed by least squares. And, and in my experience, kind of what Suchit uh, got at earlier, it's, it's something where there's not necessarily always a clear-cut winner between the two, that in some cases one, Ridge is better, in some cases Lasso is better, but hopefully that's something that Josh is going to cover more next, uh, next week, just to, to, you know, what are the cases where one's better than uh, the other. So just to kind of wrap up, uh, you know, again, the traditional linear model is very useful. Um, I don't want you to tell Dr. Stefanski that I think otherwise or anything. It's a great model. It's widely <laughs> used, elegant theory, but it does have its shortcomings. And uh, re regularized regression is really um, a way to where we can add a penalty term to what we're doing, and that's going to address some of these uh, shortcomings by exploiting the bias variance trade-off. Um, we can do some continuous variable selection depending on our penalty, and uh, as we saw, it's a very flexible framework. We have a lot of options with our loss function and our penalty, and um, we can also kind of use that penalty to incorporate prior knowledge. So that's all I had. Uh, any questions? Yeah, what's up? Um, when you actually, yeah, when you're actually doing like the estimation and stuff, so the, the penalty is there to help you actually estimate those parameters. But once you get those parameters, you actually are using your model. You're just going to use those parameters. You're not going to, like when you calculate the prediction, you don't keep that penalty around or anything. The penalty was just kind of there during the minimization, during the esti estimation step to get those parameters. But yeah, you don't actually use the penalty when you're doing the prediction. Um, what do you mean the variables aren't behaving like the predictors? Um, I guess what do you mean by not behaving? Supposing in our training model, there was something like one of the predictors you think is quite significant. Later in the validation, sorry, in the test data set, you think that it's flattening out. Mostly this can happen for your time variables. Well, uh, I mean, when we're going to the test set, we're really looking at prediction. So we're not actually fitting the model again on the test data. So I'm not necessarily going to know whether a, a predictor is significant or not in the test data set. I'm just going to, I'm fitting the model on the training data set, and that's going to tell me what the coefficients are and whether or not a variable is significant or not. But then the test set is where I actually just go, I'm just going to go and use that to actually calculate prediction error. And we actually fit our model on the training data. And then the test set is where we are estimating prediction error. That's where, as Neil said, we're kind of releasing our model into the wild to let it be free and, and start predicting so stuff. The, so the error can really blow up in the um, I mean, if that's the case, I would try different methods. Um, I mean, sometimes I guess that's, I mean, part of the issue. I mean, generally speaking, I mean, when you, uh, you know, when you do a cross-validation, that error is usually going to be smaller than the test set. Because again, that's just coming from the fact that this test set is just kind of this completely new data and that sort of stuff. And it wasn't averaged over anything like cross-validation was. Um, I mean, to my knowledge, it's more of just kind of, you know, sometimes, I mean, the error on the test set is generally going to be bigger. And that's just kind of almost how it is. Uh, it's almost more that you just, you know, you want to maybe compare a handful of methods and just see, okay, which one at least did better, even if the errors are a little on the high side. Yeah, what's up? What do you do cross validation, say, by a fold? You try to find 10, 15 different methods, and then they would give you MSC for each validation set. 
So when you have five of them, you just average them? Exactly, yep, yeah. So when you actually are looking at this graph, um, and that's kind of how these standard errors can be calculated, is that what you're doing is you're saying, okay, this is really based on averaging over the 10 different folds, because this was used with the 10-fold cross-validation. Yeah, hey, what's up? Um, personally, I, uh, and I don't know if I'm biased, I would always use regularization. Like if you're going to fit a linear model, I would try regularization just to see. I know that with, um, at least with Ridge, there is this existence theorem that there's, there's always going to be a lambda for Ridge where you're going to get better MSE than with least squares. So to me, it's one of those things that you can always, like if you're looking at prediction, you can always improve your prediction by shrinking the coefficient sum. So I, I mean, to me, almost a standard thing like I did here is I would probably, if I get a data set, I'm probably going to look at, I'm looking at least squares, I'm going to look at ridge, and I'm going to look at lasso as least as the first step. If I know of some maybe structure that exists with the data, that's when I'm going to start playing around with maybe different penalties. But as a first step, I would usually, especially nowadays, those are very easy to implement and stuff. So, you know, once you kind of get that code set up, it's very easy to just kind of turn your data through it. Yeah, what's up? So if you don't have a test set, then you're just only cross-validating and then you're going to be using a trip on it. So you would do OLS, Ridge, and Lasso, and maybe you would get three curves on this graph, one for each different method? Yeah, yeah. So this, um, so, we'll, so with least squares, you don't do cross-validation because there's no tuning parameter. You just kind of estimate it, and that's your, your, your estimates. Uh, but yeah, so this one I did, there is an equivalent graph like this for Ridge that I didn't actually show. But yeah, you would do that. You do cross-validation, and that's really going to allow you to pick your tuning parameter. Uh, but when it comes to actually seeing, OK, I have these three models. I have least squares. I have Ridge with this optimal tuning parameter. I have, uh, I have Lasso with a, this optimal tuning parameter. The test set is then going to just kind of compare, OK, between these three methods, which actually worked better. Let's say if you don't have a test set. Or Joshua. Well, um, I mean, personally, I feel like you always need some sort of test set to actually make that final choice because you can't really use just the cross-validation. Um, you you want to kind of rely on that new data to actually to make that choice. Yeah, what's up? Which R package did you use for your regression? I use the GLM net one, um, which is nice because that's how I estimated both the, uh, the lasso and the ridge. And so, like I said, uh, it's not up yet, but um, eventually there's going to be uh, a link here that you can click. And, then, and this, uh, if you want to go get more information on the data set, uh, this is an active link that you can just click on and go to Dr. Booth's website. Um, in, my, uh, in my R code, I'm directly just reading in the data from his website. So that'll make it nice that you don't have to even mess with really downloading the data or anything. You just run the code, and it's just going to read in the data for you. Yeah, what's up? So the reason you use regularization is to not overfit the data. Is that like the main reason you use regularization? Yeah, because yeah, because this is where we're trying to yeah that we're well. I mean, it's kind of. I mean, to me, it's just in general the bias variance trade off. So at one end of the spectrum. You're overfitting the data. You have low bias but high variance. But then at the other end of the spectrum, you can kind of have the flip where you have low variance but high bias. And so, regularization is where we're allowed to using that tuning parameter just kind of fine tune. Yeah, exactly, and try to find the balance between those two things. Because that's really that bias variance trade off is something that I feel like just comes up all the time in statistics. It's just kind of this natural thing that we have to cope with. And uh, the nice thing about regularization is it allows us to play around with it and, and fine tune it. Any other questions? What's what about up? The solution path? Do you yeah. So I know. So Ridge is an exception. Uh, well, you're talking about the entire path. I know. So. Um, are you saying? Sorry, you're saying like which lambda to use, or? or, or for the different, so with either Ridge regression or Lasso or other methods, do you ever have any closed form in terms of lambda? Um. 
So you have, for ridge, you do have a closed form solution uh, as a functional lambda, uh, which I think is just So this is your ridge solution. So we do have a closed form solution here, and you can see that the, the parameter comes into play here. Uh, the lasso, you, under if you make an assumption on a structure with the design matrix essentially being orthonormal, having orthonormal columns in there, then you can get a, uh, a closed form for the lasso. But in general, the lasso doesn't have a closed form solution, um, which I think is a big reason why you come up with these like solution path algorithms. And that's a very efficient way. We don't have a really necessarily a closed form way to do it, but we can use this, this efficient path algorithm to quickly get all of those estimates for us. Any other questions on anything? Uh, so like I said, uh, next week Josh Day is going to look into this a little more as far as comparing the penalties, uh, which, which are better and that sort of stuff. Uh, after that, two weeks from now, we're still looking for a presenter. So if you're interested, this would be um, a great thing to do. I, I feel like I definitely learned a lot about regularization through doing this. So I definitely would encourage doing it. Um, and like I said, if you have any feedback, either for the group or for myself, definitely let either myself or Neil or Justin uh, know. But besides that, thanks everyone for coming.